As this hearing is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on the bottom of your screen or whatever device you are, uh, you're using uh, that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings and mark or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. <clears throat> Today, we welcome three panels to testify on the conditions and oversight of the Military Housing Privatization Initiative, MH, or MHPI. The first panel will feature two residents telling their personal stories and challenges that they and their families faced while living in privatized housing. They will be joined by a privatized housing family advocate who will be able to speak broadly about the issues families faced in privatized housing across all services and housing providers. The second panel, will include the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Housing, Ms. Pat Corey, Corey, and the Director of Defense Capabilities and Management at the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, Ms. Elizabeth Field. These witnesses will be able to explain the oversight and history of privatized housing, the partnerships between the providers and the government, the steps being taken to address systemic housing issues, and the future of housing resiliency. The third panel will be representatives from five of the largest private housing companies, Balfour Beatty Communities, Corvius Military Living, Hunt Military Communities, Lend Lease Communities, and Liberty Military Housing. We expect this panel to explain current challenges privatized housing face, faces, past and current legal issues, steps being taken to improve service, and the impact of the recently implemented Tenant Bill of Rights. As we all now know, beginning in August of 2018, Reuters began publishing a series of articles chronicling health and safety issues experienced by military families living in deplorable privatized military family housing conditions. Many of us traveled to some of these uh, um, privatized family settings and were able to actually walk, do walkthroughs and see exactly the conditions that families were living in. Not to mention that these companies have been engaged in some cases in fraudulent activities being conducted by some providers. These articles prompted a groundswell of similar stories from diverse families of all services, ranks, pay grades, and geographic locations. It became quickly apparent that these issues were systemic. Service members and their families experienced mold exposure, rodent infestation, water leaks, smells, broken appliances, rude and dismissive housing management, and adding insult to injury, there was ineffective oversight of the program by the services. The Department of Defense and the housing providers they had entrusted to take care of our service members and their families had gravely failed. The services reported that a lack of visibility on work order processing had contributed to the overall lack of oversight. In addition, the system incentivized work order completion without respect to the quality of maintenance performed, which led to poor workmanship and unqualified personnel performing the work. Further, an overemphasis on occupancy rates incentivized the quick turnover of homes, which in turn can lead to a lack of preventative maintenance and repairs between tenants. The system was broken. Those who were bravely serving our nation and their families were being neglected, ignored, and taken advantage of. Since then, Congress and the Department of Defense have taken key steps to remedy the crisis and right the ship. Congress passed legislation as part of the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act that included a tenant bill of rights, which would ensure all service members and their families were given quality housing, responsive customer service, and the right to challenge the system for wrongdoing without the threat of retaliation. In February 2020, the Department of Defense announced that the Defense Secretary and the Uniformed Service Secretaries signed the tenant bill of rights, implementing 15 of the 18 tenant rights. And finally, on August 1st, 2021, the department signed the updated Bill of Rights, implementing all 18 rights. 
I was glad to see that all privatized housing partners testifying today implemented these 18 essential rights for our service members and their families. And we had a, uh, at the beginning of this process, we had a very comprehensive oversight hearing like we are doing today to make sure that we could hear from affected families, make sure that we could hear from the government, uh, the governmental agencies responsible for oversight, and, uh, and also to, to hear from the companies. And there is clearly still much to be done. As we've seen by the continued stream of negative stories making their way to the press, which is part of the reason for calling this hearing today, because we wanna make sure, particularly because we're responsible for the quality of life of these military families, that we make sure that we are conducting the oversight to be, be certain that the Tenant Bill of Rights, all 18 of them are implemented and that we don't have uh, you know, a regression when it comes to progress. And that includes not only persistent issues with inadequate housing conditions and quality of service, but also the troubling, shameful, and frankly infuriating revelations of illegal incentive fee fraud committed by multiple providers. I look forward to hearing some explanations today from those privatized housing providers and how they are making systemic changes in the operations and oversight of their housing portfolio. And I know uh, my colleagues join me in expecting full transparency. This is an important hearing in which we will discuss the state of military privatized housing, the progress made over the last few years, the ongoing challenges faced by our military families and the crucial steps we must take moving forward. I do wanna thank all of the witnesses for attending today and my colleagues for participating in what will be a longer than normal hearing. And I'm looking forward to an informative candid conversation. At this time, I'd like to yield to my ranking member who's been really a fierce advocate for military families, particularly uh, given that he represents so many of them for his opening statement. Judge? Good morning, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, you know, I'm pleased we're kicking this off, these hearings, because it's great to get to work on the 23 uh, budget requests. We all know that safe and adequate military housing is key to readiness. I want our soldiers and sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, all those folks to have good housing, sufficient housing, so that they don't have the worries of what's going on with their families when they're deployed. Nothing could be worse. Active duty and deployment are tough enough without worrying about your family back home. I'm disappointed when we can continue to hear these stories about problems and privatized housing. When I came on this committee, Chet Edwards was the chair, and he was one of my colleagues from back in Texas. And everybody was so proud of the new housing program. And it's a crying shame that we're dealing with these kind of issues with something we were so proud of less than 15 years ago. So something's wrong, very badly wrong. And believe me, I know what mold infestation is because the first term I ran for Congress, I had it in my house and I lived in my garage with my beautiful wife and for nine months while I was campaigning. So you, you can't pull the wool over my eyes. I know what it is. I'm looking forward to Find out about this. I want to hear about what's going on with this at Fort Hood. I'm looking forward to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. And thank you for being the partner that you've been uh, right through and, and also for really providing the committee and me with, uh, with the legislative history uh, about this. It's been important and helpful. So now we will welcome our first panel. Private Cody Calderon, Ms. Nikki Wiley, and Ms. Rachel Christian. This panel includes a service member, Private Calderon, and a military spouse, Ms. Nikki Wiley, who are currently residents in military family housing. They will describe the conditions that they have encountered, the difficulties they face in persuading officials to address serious maintenance issues, and the problems with receiving adequate remediation. They are joined by a military housing family advocate, Ms. Rachel Christian, who can testify about the experiences and treatment of service members across all services and housing providers. We'll start with Private Calderon, then Ms. Wiley, and finally Ms. Christian. 
In light of the many witnesses that we have today and the multiple panels, I'd ask that everyone keep their opening statements to three minutes. We certainly have a lot of ground to cover today. Private Calderon, your full written testimony will be included in the record and you are recognized for three minutes to summarize your opening statement. Thank you so much, Madam Chairman. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak today. And the story I'll share is not really unique. And while I'm going to fill it with the specifics to me, it's just, it's not specific to me. Uh, I think of the hopeless, the voiceless, the sick while I'm speaking to you now, those that are willing to literally sacrifice all and the families who support them. I think about the heroism it takes to not sit idly by for the worst thing a human can do is turn a blind eye to injustice. That's how I feel. And my name is Cody Calderon. I'm a husband. I'm a soldier. Yesterday was the one year anniversary of my first day in the army. And today I gather the courage given to me by my wife, my peers, my leaders to share my family's experience with privatized housing in the military. I was placed in Corvius Housing on August 12, 2001. That was 11 days after the revised military privatized housing initiative, Tenants' Bill of Rights, was placed into effect. My wife, Alyssa, immediately knew something was wrong with the home. We couldn't pinpoint it. We chalked it up to environmental allergens or just the shock of a new lifestyle. Now, being 32, I'm afforded a few advantages over your typical private first class. Firstly, I've dealt with these problems in the civilian sector. I've battled landlords. I've, I've fought for housing. I have the confidence and conviction to take this head on. I'm not afraid to fight for right for what's right, regardless of the consequences, like I feel other service members may be. But a great leader told me to always choose the hard right over the easy left, and I live by that. So here are the hard facts. There's mold in my home. No standard was followed to ensure safe remediation. And the Army agrees to follow Installation Management Command, IMCOM, standards, and they accept the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, that's the IICRC, as the guideline for proper maintenance. And I need to stress the implementation of the Tenants' Bill of Rights. It's not just a list of suggestions. They're a standard that's required to guarantee the health, safety, and rights of the individual. And that's what we're fighting for here, the rights of the individuals that put in a maintenance request. They have the work performed that did not follow IICRC standard. They're told that home is safe to live in, and then they subsequently get sick because of negligence. Corvius turns the unit over to the next soldier's family, and this just happens in perpetuity. Now, both of the homes that we have been offered since this issue with our original home, they've been riddled with mold and maintenance issues. I've submitted dispute resolution paperwork, res requested my schedule for uh, displacement per diem. I've spoken with the military housing office, asked for rightfully owed timelines. I've gotten nothing. I haven't had any correspondence in seven days. My wife and I have gone from hotel to hotel over the past month. We find ourselves now, as I sit here right now, in an Airbnb, 30 minutes from base, and I have to commute three or four times a day with $4 a gallon gas prices. All of these expenses coming out of my pocket because no one's taking accountability. And this is moral hazard as it's worst, in my opinion. In the Army, if a soldier fails to meet or exceed an expectation, they're held accountable. But if a housing company fails, who does the accountability fall on? And I feel like for too long, privatized housing companies have operated with the sense of impunity, just leaving countless families in the wake of their negligence. Each citizen puts their faith in us to protect the standards of this country. But what happens when the standard, the foundation that supports those protectors is built on these mold and sewage and lead and pest issues? If we're as strong as our weakest and as fast as our slowest, how ready are we really if we're as healthy as our sickest? The Army's mission is to fight and win the nation's wars. But what do you do when we're fighting to win the war on safe and habitable housing in our own nation? Thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Next, uh, appreciate it, Private Calderon. We'll look forward to, to engaging in some Q&A with you. Ms. Wiley, your full written testimony will be included in the record, and you are recognized for three minutes to summarize your opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, good morning, esteemed committee subcommittee members. Um, I'm Nikki Wiley, wife and partner of Marine Corps Master Sergeant Trevor Wiley for 12 of the 18 years he served on active duty. In November of 2018, after four months living between Airbnbs um, while on the housing wait list, we accepted a house in the Shadow Mountain community in 29 Palms, California. The disclosures we had to sign upon acceptance, including lead paint, asbestos, and other potential hazards were alarming, but at this point we needed stability for our family. Um, as soon as we moved in, our previously healthy children began experiencing breathing difficulties, skin rashes, and allergy-like symptoms. 
um, just two months into living in our home, we experienced our first water intrusion incident requiring baseboard removal and an industrial blower, which caused my then one-year-old to exhibit symptoms almost instantly. Over the following year, we repeatedly voiced our concerns to LMH maintenance staff and their maintenance manager over the presence of mold, the unsafe nature of the air we were breathing, and the impact on our children's deteriorating health. By this time, my one-year-old had uh, recurring pneumonia and opacities on his lungs. Um, their only consolations were to repeatedly use their moisture meter and put it in my wall and tell me that if this, at this given moment in time, um, in this particular area, their, their readings weren't high, there couldn't possibly be mold present in my home, um, or they would offer Band-Aid fixes like caulking over visible mold. Um, finally, a turning point came in December of 2019 when we had a gas leak. I detected it, I evacuated my family, and I notified Lincoln. Um, their maintenance uh, worker came in and told me, all clear, there was no gas leak. By this point, I trusted my judgment, my intuition over Lincoln's definition of safety, and I called in the base fire department, who determined we did in fact have a gas leak that could have had um, lethal ramifications. Now, using this blatant disregard for our safety, as well as some other asbestos-related issues in the community, I contacted an LMH executive who passed my concern on to their vice president. The VP was finally set the gears in motion to finally get my home tested for mold. Um, however, a Lincoln worker and maintenance manager came out for a pre-inspection wherein they cleaned my vents and wiped away visible evidence of mold prior to the, the real inspection. The next week, a contracted company inspected my home and acknowledged spots, spots of water intrusion and mold verbally to me, but later refused to acknowledge the presence of mold in informal reports. Um, upon my insistence, they did contain the impacted areas, which included all three bathrooms, my HVAC unit, my laundry room, and an exterior wall of my home. However, only after excessive back and forth did LMH finally change out my HVAC coils and duct work. Uh, we were out of our home for a total of 32 days, during which time LMH continued to collect our BAH as we were shuffled between hotels before eventually being placed in junior enlisted off-base housing. Um, we did receive a $75 per diem check for the days we were displaced, but not until well after we were back in our home. Thus, it could have been a great financial burden for a family without uh, monetary reserves. I would like to unequivocally express concern that privatized housing companies are utilizing contractors and subcontractors whose revenue is generated almost entirely by the housing companies and who are therefore acting as a mouthpiece for the housing companies', companies interests with a fear of losing a large amount of their revenue if they disagree or even abide by proper protocols. I witnessed this both first and second hand throughout this process. Uh, additionally, throughout our housing issues, Lincoln repeatedly attempted to discredit my husband with his, his relationship with his command. I would ask that moving forward, no other family should suffer a detriment to the service member command relationship merely because they're speaking out about their housing issues. Families should not have to choose between living on base and keeping their families safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Wiley. <clears throat> And last but not least, Ms. Christian, your fellow written testimony will be included in the record. You're recognized for three minutes to summarize your opening statement. Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, the Armed Forces Housing Advocates are proud to represent families living in privatized military housing across the nation. Still, we are dispirited that an organization such as ours is necessary to exist. My name is Rachel Christian, and I am co-founder of the Armed Forces Housing Advocates, along with Sarah Klein, Kate Needham, and Noel Potzel. We believe that readiness starts with a safe home. The lives, health, and safety of our military families are at risk daily, and even more egregious are the continued disability rights violations that they face. Today, we see environmental hazards and improper repairs being completed, maintenance staff performing plumbing and electrical work without training or proper certifications. At Fort Drum, a family experienced a natural gas leak in their home for six months. When the maintenance director was asked about his team's qualifications at the site, he replied that they had none and that none were required. Many reasonable accommodations for families with disabilities are being denied or ignored. The housing partner often requests unreasonable amounts of information and puts layers of red tape in place for even the most minor requests. Requests for window fall prevention devices are denied or installed with extraordinary costs. Since 2019, seven children at Naval Base San Diego have fallen from windows and suffered traumatic brain injuries. Sewage leaks are common occurrence in military housing. Housing partners will refuse to replace carpets that have been soaked in raw sewage and will pump sewage into yards where children play. Faulty construction at Fort Leonard Wood left a military spouse with a, train, a traumatic brain injury just within this past year. And yet the, the company responsible is refusing to reply to the request for assistance. 
These examples are not unique and only a portion of the problem. Under the Tenants' Bill of Rights, an electronic work order system was implemented. It is clear that there are mass discrepancies between the documentation in that system and the work orders being placed by residents. The Tenants' Bill of Rights has also provided dispute resolution to some military housing tenants. However, most families are being turned away and denied access to the dispute process for arbitrary reasons. The discretionary fashion of this so-called right leads to more frustration and families believing that they have no recourse. Rights are not rights if the families cannot access or utilize them. Military families should not have to turn to social media to be heard. Families deserve an outlet that they can count on when local housing management systems fail. H.R. 7144 would create a public feedback tool for military families, which Congress can use to identify issues and hold housing companies accountable proactively. Readiness starts with a safe home, and we are not ready. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for your opening remarks and, and for your participation today. We'll proceed in the standard five minute rounds, recognizing members in order of seniority as they joined at the beginning of the hearing, alternating between majority and minority. And please be mindful of your time and allow the witnesses time to answer within your five minute turn. Um, I, I'll, I'll begin um, <clears throat> by just thanking all three of you for being here today. Your experiences, whether they're living in privatized housing personally or working with families that live in privatized housing are really gonna help the subcommittee understand the issues that have plagued our service members and their families and that continue to do so. Um, I do wanna ask uh, Private Calderon and Ms. Wiley uh, if you have anything to add that you know, was um, not able to be included in your opening statement um, in terms of the housing and the challenging challenges that you faced when you were trying to report those issues to your service or to the private housing companies. And, and really what I would be interested in knowing is has this gotten any better? I realize that all 18 tenant bill of rights elements weren't all implemented until last August. So that's not that long a time a time frame, but have you noticed any improvement? So are there any additional housing um, challenges, both in terms of the, the problems plaguing your own home um, and the response time uh, and, and response quality from your service or the private housing company? We'll start with Private Calderon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Urgency. There has, I have felt like there's been no sense of urgency and this has been going on for well over a month. It's disheartening because I also feel like my wife doesn't have a voice in any of this and she's dealing with most of this while I'm trying to do my job at work. They won't listen to her. It would be really amazing if we were allowed that sort of separation where our, our spouses could handle some of these issues, but we've been shut down at every turn. And I'm also tired of not getting specific, at least timelines for what's going on. They're just leaving me in the dark. The company is, is leaving you in the dark? Yes. Or this, and how, how was this, your services response? Well, it was responsiveness. We, um, what we did in, I think the last fiscal year, there really wasn't an oversight layer in the, you know, at, at DOD. Um, and we provided funding to ensure that they could put in a layer of oversight at the service level. And then, you know, I know what they initially did was they put in your base level oversight. H have you noticed a change since either of those uh, oversight measures were taken? I don't know if I'm entirely qualified to answer that, seeing as the short amount of time that I've been in the service. So right, honestly, right. I would not be able to accurately answer that. Okay, that, that's fair. Um, Ms. Wiley? Sure, we've, we've been in it definitely for, for long enough. So, hope, so if yeah. you think uh, <laughs> thankfully, a lot of our um, major concerns were abated. Um, I will say in the, I kind of avoid Lincoln primarily right now in terms of calling, I'm sorry, Liberty, um, they're, not, they're not Liberty. Um, I don't call them in that, that regularly if, if I can help it. Um, but in the couple of instances where I have had them in, I've had a couple of, of you know, minor things like, well, they didn't like not, not following up with a water intrusion issue we had um, on December 25th. I mean, it was on Christmas, um, but they came into my home on that day and then 
there was never any follow-up. And in the work order, it shows that it was, the follow-up was canceled. I didn't cancel it. So um, mm -hmm. I, I also say things like I'm supposed to be having a HEPA filter up replaced monthly. That was a part of the conditions, I guess, of me re-entering my home when we did. And that has not happened. So I won't say that things are any better. Um, those are minor concerns, but I'm assuming that if I'm seeing minor things on a house that was you know, kind of a big priority to them for a while, that others um, aren't probably seeing much the same. And, and from both of you, ha have you heard, I, I assume you have heard from fellow service members with similar issues in regard to reporting housing deficiencies or requesting remediation or responsiveness from your own service in order to, uh, your own services oversight of the housing companies? At Fort Polk, yes, on a daily basis. So these are not unique. You're not alone. Not at all in any way, shape, or form. Well, gosh, Private Calderon, since you've only been here a year <laughs> and we've engaged in passage of the Tenant Bill of Rights and implementation of it, um, it's disturbing that you wouldn't have at least seen some, some notice, uh, at least if not noticed some improvement. Um, what you're describing seems identical to what we heard in the in the original hearing that we had. Um, and Ms. Wiley, you've been you've been around a while. Um, it, it doesn't sound any different for for your family either. That's disturbing. Um, okay, and then Ms. Christian, I just have a quick question I want to get in. Could you could you tell us about the work that your organization does and the resources that you provide? And can you give us um, a, a broad overview? of the issues you've seen across the board and the lack of responsiveness? Sure, so um, our organization is a grassroots nonprofit that um, since May has assisted over 1300 military families um, across the country, uh, spreading a variety of issues um, from minor you know, incidences with housing all the way up to assisting families filing federal, um, Fair Housing Act complaints um, seeking out their representatives. Um, but our main purpose is to help families work within the current system that they're provided. So we have a step process that teaches families how to go to their chain of command, how to um, send emails out. Some, some spouses are um, alone and have never sent a professional email. Um, so we assist them in that whole process. And it's, it's advocacy in teaching them how to advocate for themselves because we know this issue is going to be a common one that they're going to occur um, throughout their, their time in the service. So we teach them so that maybe next time if they have an issue, they're able to um, proactively do it for themselves. Uh, and, and I will say we do get a lot of issues handled that way, um, but we do still see problems such that um, PFC Calderon sees every day um, throughout our work. Thank you. Um, my time's expired, and uh, gosh, I have a lot more questions. But you know, we'll we'll just submit those uh, to you, and if you can answer them for the record, because I really do want to get as broad a sense from you all, the ones experiencing all these challenges, as as possible for uh, for the members. Judge Carter, you're recognized for five minutes. The two witnesses and talking, the residents. How old are those residences? Do you have any idea? Um, I believe I believe the Shadow Mountain community was, I know it was during the 1970s. I'm not certain of the exact year. Okay. The PFC Calderon? I know that my home was built in 1988, but most of the other homes in my neighborhood are either from 1982 or 1979, I believe. That's, 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 the truth is we need to do new construction, but we're having trouble with new construction too. So that's another issue. Do you know whether or not, well, you probably wouldn't, but these things were built, there was a built-in maintenance pot of money provided to the builders at the time they signed the contract. Either one of you? No, sir. Um, I know at the time that our homes were built, um, they were obviously not under the, um, they didn't fall under the current system. Um, they were they were military owned, so I, I couldn't, couldn't speak to that either. Okay, well, I'll ask the next panel. Well, let me tell you, you have my sympathy. 
because if you hear the, how bad I talk, how much I cough, there's a whole lot to do to a mold infection back in 2002 in my house. And I've never quite gotten over it. So God bless you. Are you back? Thank, Thank you. you, Judge. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Case, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in all honesty, this is just a really frustrating hearing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in my fourth year on this committee, and the very first hearing when I joined the committee in 2019 was on privatized housing. Um, and I, I have the distinct sense that um, we, we, we just are still not on track um, in terms of where we're trying to get to. And so for me, I'm trying to understand <clears throat> exactly what the situation is, where the problem is right now, and see if we can somehow go back and get our fingers on it. I mean, we've moved on tenants bill of rights. We've moved on a uh, greater requirement of military engagement. We've tried to move on, on access to information and complaints. We've tried to you know, move on on required um, timetables for for repairs, and and yet we have this hearing, and so that's just deeply frustrating. And and I apologize to you for for the fact that we that you're still in this situation. Um, I, I guess I'd like to understand what I'm trying to understand is how widespread is the problem still? We have 78 some odd uh, privatized housing uh, <clears throat> communities throughout our country. Um, private, you've, I, I think if I understand your, your testimony correctly, you've lived in one of those um, over one year. Um, so obviously you're experiencing issues there. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Wiley, you've lived in four, is that right? Uh, I, think, I think I read your resume and it said you've been in six different places, but two of them your own home, is that right? So have you been in four communities? Sorry, you're muted, you're muted. Any technical difficulties. Um, no, I've actually only lived in two in two military communities. Um, and as it would happen, they've actually both been aboard 29 Palms at two different times we were stationed out here. Um, okay. One, one and was then, okay, I understand that. And then and and Ms. Christian, you obviously are advocating across the board. So here's the general question. Are we still talking about a systematic problem across the system in, in your view, or are we talking about a fairly isolated or at least narrowing? Uh, communities that are still highly problematic, or for that matter, uh, companies versus, you know, a, a, a broader kind of indictment of the entire system. That's what I'm trying to get to, because, you know, I, I have many of those communities um, in, in Hawaii. We, we have tens of thousands of military families uh, of, of living in privatized communities in Hawaii, and and there are issues, but they don't they don't seem to at least arise to the same level of kind of systematic as is true in elsewhere and other parts of the country. So that's what I'm trying to trying to just make sense of it. So let me just start, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Private Kelleron, you, you said you, you speak for many other people, and I'm sure you do. What's your sense of it? Are we still dealing with, with, a, with a systematic issue here where we've just got to go back to the beginning and, and talk about much broader solutions? Or are we, are we on the right track and narrowing in on solutions? Or what's your assessment? I think as a whole, we're on the right track. I think the most difficult part about this is people become stuck in their ways. There are people that work for these companies that have been there for decades, uh, longer even. So it's difficult to teach a dog new tricks sort of thing. They're used to the operating in this way. And now we're implementing these new standards and there's like, well, I don't want to have to actually do my job now. I do think it is, it does sort of need to be torn down. I think we need people that are advocates for health and safety and not profit. I think we need to prioritize that um, generally and very specifically. And yes, I do speak with people quite often. I just spoke with a, a woman in my unit the other day who gave birth three months, two months premature. The child has health issues, was working all the way up through her pregnancy, uh, conceived and gave birth and still lives in that same home, says that her ceiling is bubbling down, there's mold, the floor is creaky. It's just, it's, it's so upsetting to me that it's, it's just blatant disregard entirely understood and 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 I guess I'm just trying to focus in on how how widespread is that situation how widespread is that sentiment still so Ms. Christian in, in the time I have remaining what's your assessment across the entire system the 68 some odd uh, communities um, is it still systematic or is this specific to companies uh, you know some cultures of some companies as the private uh, just said some companies um, have have a harder time changing than other companies uh, or 
or is it specific to older? Uh, wh what's your answer? It's absolutely systemic still. And I will tell you that the issue is not necessarily with the um, individuals on the installation levels, but rather um, the impact that they're truly able to have on the installation. We now have a tenant's bill of rights where a government housing office is um, dictating whether or not a family has access to dispute resolution. They now have individuals coming in and checking their homes and qualifying them as being safe or not in between turnovers, which hypothetically is a great idea and something that I would love to see if it was implemented in a way um, with someone who is certified. We just had a, a recent inspection go through and an army family um, had two gas leaks missed in their homes by the government housing office em employee. And it's because they're not certified or trained in this. Um, okay. had, so I, I do believe that there is a, a, a missing piece there that if implemented would change this. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Case. And one of the frustrating things about Ms. Christian's response just now is that part of the problem was that the companies were sending in unqualified people just to get through the ticket, you know, the, the, the tickets that have been submitted rather than actually send somebody in who knows what they're doing. I, I mean, how do you not send in a, a specialist who knows how to handle a gas leak? I, I, I just, I, I feel like I'm stuck in 2019. And, and, and that there's, you know, recognizing that the, the, the Bill of Rights implementation, you know, is less than a year, year in, but, but I guess we'll ask the, our, next, our next panel um, and the panel after that, those questions. Um, forgive me. <laughs> Mr. Valadeo, uh, you recognize for five minutes of questions. And also, um, I, I know I have um, one other question for this panel. So if anyone has a second round question, just, just let me know. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity, and I really do appreciate you getting this uh, hearing together. I think this is a very important topic. Um, I've personally gone out to some of the housing in my district at the Naval Air Station Lemoore. Uh, we've had some issues ourselves trying to work with some of these uh, facilities, uh, improving houses, building new houses. I mean, the problem is just across the board, and it truly is a frustrating thing. So, Mr. Calderon, Ms. Wiley, Ms. Christian, uh, thank you for joining us today and sharing your stories. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Calderon, I sincerely hope that your immediate housing concerns are addressed as swiftly as possible. I mean, I think we all need to I mean, hold these guys to a, a higher standard. But my question is to Ms. Christian. Uh, the Tenants' Bill of Rights, which we talked about a little bit here, were implemented two years ago. And in your testimony, you expressed the concern, and I know that the chairwoman just mentioned it as well, lack of training, the lack of qualified people, which we're seeing across the country in all different segments. But what do we need to do better uh, when it comes to training these advocates? I mean, what would you say are the most important topics we really need to hit on? Um, training, talk about that a little bit. training needs to be um, specialized to, to what they're looking at, right? If you are in North Carolina and you are a North Carolina certified home inspector, that should be the type of person you're seeking out to come and clear these houses. Um, these are going to be the types of people that we want in these houses and ensuring that the safety is, is going on. Um, Tenants Bill of Rights did allow for a um, industry standard of treatment in one of the rights, but there's actually no clear definition of industry standard unless you deep, dig deep down into state law. And because of the lack of training um, across the board, some of our installation commanders still don't realize that state laws need to be followed um, on the installations with the government housing office. And that's on the burden of the resident to prove um, to the installation commanders, to their government housing employees, and then also to the local level um, uh, privatized housing partners. So the training really needs to be specific to home inspections. I don't believe that's an outlandish request. Um, and it sounds sort of simple, right? You would think that the person coming in would be certified um, say that you were checking the electrical in a home, Georgia, Fort Stewart um, has a lot of electrical issues on their installation and they have non-electricians coming in and certifying um, fire hazards that have caused fires um, throughout the electrical wiring, even, even though an electrician has said it was not accurate. Um, so things like that really need to be put in place. And I do think the system that you have implemented with the Tenants' Bill of Rights could work if we went that route. 
Okay, so I mean the training, making sure these people are qualified, have a background in it. I mean, as far as us getting the information out, obviously we've worked with some constituents of our own, and just making sure that we go through the list of check marks. All right, did you uh, did you reach out to this person on your base? Did you reach out to this person within the company that is supposed to be overseeing? We always try to make sure they're doing those things. Um, but if they're sending people aren't qualified, obviously that's a huge problem for us. So uh, obviously that's one we need to focus on. Uh, again, I appreciate all the testimony. I don't have any more questions for this specific panel, uh, Madam Chair, so I'll just yield back the rest of my time. So thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Valadeo. Next up is Ms. Lee. You're recognized for five minutes. I, I have no questions for this panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much then. Uh, Mr. Bishop? Are you with us? All right, um, seeing that Mr. Bishop is not here at the moment, we'll go uh, to Mr. Rutherford. You're recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I uh, wanna thank the uh, panelists for uh, being here this morning and sharing. And, and I wanna follow up uh, and, and concur with the remarks by my, my good friend from Hawaii, Mr. Case. Um, but I apologize. Uh, the, the pictures that I saw uh, that you all have provided is reprehensible. No one should uh, live in a situation like that. Uh, the black mold, the just horrible conditions. And and so, Miss Miss Christian, if if I could ask you. Um, you know, when you were describing the advocacy group's uh, role uh, about training the individual members to deal with uh, their leadership on base, um, is, is, should we maybe put more control or, or, or greater responsibility on the advocacy group to not only train um, individuals who are living in these conditions, how to how to advocate for themselves, but should we have some some role that the advocates could play in engaging uh, leadership that is not getting these things done on time? I, I know out of the recommendations that came through, I, I think only eight or ten have been. Uh, actually implemented so far and the, and the land lease, or lease people are, I, I guess, delaying the rest until they can renegotiate. Um, so should, should we look possibly at, at putting more power into the hands of the advocates? I, I honestly do not think so. Um, I think that this is such a, um, in the, in the civilian world, this would be a simple problem, right? You have a problem with your landlord, you request a, a, a fix, um, and if not, you go to the next, which would be either your, your county or your state. Um, I, I think that the, the onus really needs to be um, on that government housing office to be relaying the information correctly up through their chain to the installation level and as well on the privatized housing partner, they need to see some type of um, recourse taken against their actions, which is has only so far been done in the public eye. This hearing is a great way to do that, um, show that they, you know, this is a problem, but there's not been um, on installation level, any type of, of immediate recourse for employees or for government housing employees that are denying families their rights. So I, I don't think that um, adding another layer is going to make it any better um, simply because we don't have the initial base for a, a structure to work. Yeah, well, I'm not suggesting that we add another layer. I'm suggesting that we just put more tools in your toolbox. Um, that, so th th let, let me ask this, because I, I can tell you, I, I have three military installations in my district. Our housing uh, at uh, Naval Station uh, Mayport, NAS Jack, we don't seem to have these problems. Our, ours are going pretty well, actually. 
according to our tenants. Uh, so when when I when I see these photographs that were provided to us, and, and we ought to we we ought to broadcast those somewhere. Uh, but in addition to that, I hear you testify that nine children have fallen out of windows. Um, first of all, that, that was in San Diego. Can you tell me what company that is? Yes, that's Liberty. Um, and that is just in the past four years at one installation. DOD is supposed to be sending the information on the number of children falling from military housing units um, to you all. Um, we've been trying to get that information because we do know that the numbers being reported are extremely low in comparison um, to the actual numbers of children falling from windows. So now you may not have this information, but do you know how they're falling out? I mean, that that seems like an inordinate number of children to me to be so, falling out windows. Are they are they windows that go ceiling to floor? And they're open because the air conditioning is not working or? So there's uh, several reasons, um, but a lot of them uh, occur because the window sills are low on the second story. Um, yeah. Evan's law is a law that was put into place after Evan English passed away in Hawaii falling from um, a, a, a window unit. Um, and that is really the case. Um, military families are moving frequently. Children aren't used to the environments they're in. Um, they have simple things like insect screens instead of, I remember when I, you know, when you're younger, if you're in an older house, you could push on those screens on those windows and nothing would happen. Um, they're put in by duct tape or, or held in incorrectly. So um, just, just the requirement to just have, um, if, if requested, to put in an actual window guard um, would be a wonderful addition and would um, save the lives of children, honestly, um, in military housing. We recently had a resident ask for window guards, and the response was, there's a sticker on the window that says window fall risk. A sticker is not but, going to save the life of a child. No, absolutely. Madam Chair, I see my time has run out, uh, but I want to thank you for this panel. And uh, we really need to continue to push on this issue. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, for, for doing that. You're welcome. Yeah, something's something's not working. <laughs> that, that's what this that, that's what this hearing is is trying to get to the bottom of. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Okay, um, I don't I don't see um, Mr. Bishop. Uh, okay, so uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you recognize for your five minutes of questions. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I really appreciate you holding this hearing. Uh, I think uh, uh, I appreciate the, the uh, testimony from, from the panel, and what you'll find is this committee is uh, committed to, uh, to solving this issue, and it's been uh, an issue for far too long. And I spent 20 years in the Navy, so when we talk about, uh, when we talk about housing, I, I, I've lived it. Uh, my friends have lived it. My loved ones have lived it. And one of the things that comes to mind is every service member has a housing story, everyone. Uh, I remember one of, one of my stories was uh, we, uh, we had just had a, a new baby, Daniel, and uh, I was living in housing and we couldn't use our living room because it was as if we were sitting outside. There was no insulation. It was really cold. We we're in Maryland at the time, uh, but there's always something. And I think it's gotten to the point to where uh, that's become the standard and it should not be that way. You know, here we have uh, service members deployed all over the, the United States. And I would argue if they're worried about what's happening at home, they're not focused on the job that they have to do. So it absolutely uh, is connected to, re to readiness. You know, my questions, I have a couple of questions and I'd love to hear some comments. Uh, my first question is uh, for Ms. Christensen. Do you have any feedback from families on using the interactive customer evaluation portal to provide comments or complaints regarding their housing? So anytime we've actually had residents try to put um, anything into a portal that is run by the, by the company, um, we've had instances where the information's being changed on the back end. So I'll give you an example. A family put in and said they had a lead-based paint hazard that needed um, an inspection. And the company repeatedly removed the words lead-based paint from the terminology, even after multiple emails to both the housing company and the housing office to get those words back in there. 
um, they refuse to do so. So um, situations like that are not uncommon. That's just one example that I'm, I'm allowed um, per that resident to speak about. Um, but this is happening across the board where those, those items are not being um, tracked properly. Yeah, no, thank you for that. What, what I hear from not only my constituents, I have several bases in the district, Fort, Fort Bliss, uh, Lackland Air Force Base, Laughlin Air Force Base, not only from my constituents, but also from my former uh, shipmates and, and people I've served with all over the country. Uh, essentially, the, the theme is one thing, is they don't feel as if they have a voice. Uh, they feel as if they are constantly kind of shunned or pushed to the side. And regardless of their pay grade, regardless if they're a PFC and they're 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 new to service, or if they're you know senior uh, senior folks, they've all kind of been pushed to the side. I think that's one thing maybe we can work on. Uh, I would love to work with with your organization to try to come up with maybe some some real time solutions when somebody picks up the phone and says, "Hey, I need this," that they get a real time uh, response. Uh, Ms. Ms. Wiley, I, I have a question for you, and the question is, you know, we, we've got several other panels after this, you know, uh, the, the Secretary of, of Defense that's in charge of housing, and then, of course, the, uh, the leadership of these different private uh, housing organizations themselves. If you were in my shoes, what would you ask them? One, <clears throat> pardon me, one question I would definitely want answered um, would be, what, what portion of the contractors that they utilize work almost exclusively for the housing companies. Um, I ask that because I'm finding in a lot of cases, both my, with my our personal and other um, residents in my neighborhood with issues, um, we're finding that the, the results that they get from outside, when outside testing occurs, vice when some of these contracted companies that are the go-to companies, um, we're finding that those are not necessarily aligning and that almost across the board, um, the contractors that are their go the go-to contractors that have the bulk of their revenue from the housing companies will align their interests with the housing companies. And, and that leads to some, some false reports, um, some not following proper protocol, um, things of that nature. And I saw that personally throughout our process, for sure. Great, and, and uh, I'll ask one, line, uh, one final question before my time is up. And this is for uh, PFC Calderon. Look, you, you look sharp, man. You look sharp in uniform. Clearly you're just starting your career off. I'm really excited for you. How does the, the quality of, of, of uh, military housing impact your decision on if you're gonna stay, uh, if you're gonna stay in service or if you're gonna punch out? It's a tremendous impact. It has unfortunately really pushed me away because I, I got an eviction during COVID and I still have some utility bills on my credit and my wife has some debt. So we really can't rent. We even went to go look at off-base housing and I feel like the issue with where we are, especially in Fort Polk, is that they kind of know they have a they have a corner of the market that really lets them kind of do what they want because the options are so limited. There's one Airbnb in this area. It's there are really not a lot of options. So for me, it kind of makes me feel: Do I want to take this gamble again? Which is really unfortunate because, as I said, I'm 32. I've lived a life. I've done a lot of things. I've started companies. I've failed. I've tried again. I really wanted to do 20 years. I don't think I could do 20 years of this. I don't think I could put my wife through 20 years of this just for a retirement. And that's the God's honest truth. Great, well, thank you. My time is up and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. That is so disturbing, Harvey Calderon. Uh, I, uh, it seems very basic that your housing should not be a, a, a thought in your mind <laughs> and and, the fact that it would drive you out of the service, um, a career choice that you were trying to make is, is just an abomination. Uh, for all three of you, and um, I think I'm the only one with a round two question, for, but for, um, for all three of you, if you could answer for me, since the implementation of the Tenant Bill of Rights and the what we've been told is layer of oversight on base from the service where they have supposedly put in place someone that residents of privatized military housing can go to that is an employed by the service that is responsible for, you know, taking care of responsiveness or lack thereof, you know, helping you man you maneuver and interact with the company that is responsible for fixing your issues. Uh, have you noticed any difference 
since the implementation of that layer of oversight and the tenant bill of rights. Do you have better response time? Do you feel like you have a place to go if there is a lack of responsiveness? And are you getting what you need in terms of the quality and speed of the workmanship to fix any issues? Private Calderon, you can begin. Again, I, I don't feel like I have too much time and experience in, but from going back and reading people's posts that they do reach but out. You're experiencing, you're experiencing problems yourself. So I whether am. it was what happened before or not, do you feel like you have a place you can go to get responsiveness from your service when you're not getting it from the company? And you've made clear what the problem is with the company's responsiveness. I don't. I wish I could expand on that more, but I there's just this general sense of there's no priority. There's no urgency. Because, because there's not someone to go to, or because when you go to the person that's responsible for that, they're they're not taking care of your your needs. That is how I felt. That is how I felt though. So the military housing office is obligated to provide us with an advocate who's supposed to work on our behalf, help us through situations like this. In my mm -hmm. case, that failed me. I had to reach out. I had to find third party advocacy. My wife had to find third party advocacy because we weren't being guided properly. We weren't being told what to do. We were making mistakes, but nobody was kind of like holding our hand. This is a complicated process. I don't know how to do it. I'm still learning how to do my job. So yeah, I do feel failed. Ms. Wiley. I will agree with a lot of what, um, what PSC Calderon said with regard to um, the government housing office um, has been of very little um, assistance, unfortunately, with, with navigating this. Um, my, my husband actually ended up switching units um, after, you know, the command was really unable to, part of the part of the switch was we're glad now that we're in a different command because we were, command wasn't able to help us, we, but we had nowhere to go. We felt very alone against kind of the giant that is um, the housing company and their complicit contract contractors. <sighs> And, and Ms. Christian, can you speak to the experience of the families that you've interacted with in terms of whether there's been improvement in where they can go for assistance when they're not getting the kind of, um, you know, the kind of response they need out of the company responsible for dealing with their challenges? I, I believe this is a really individual to installation question. Um, I do think that there are some advocates on the installation um, in different locations that are doing an amazing job trying to help residents. Um, but their hands are tied. So regardless of if um, they have the ability and they are doing their job, I will say that I only know of three installations where the government housing office has successfully helped residents in any meaningful way um, when they've gone to them. Um, but I would say that even if they do try to assist them or give them information, they don't know state or local laws and they most definitely are very poorly versed on disability laws. So when residents are asking questions as it relates to um, a Fair Housing Act violation or whether or not um, the implementation, implementation of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act applies on their installation, that resident advocate does not know um, and has nobody really to seek counsel from to get that resident an answer. Fabulous, okay. Um, Judge Carter, do you have any additional questions? I'll, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> oh, no, I take that as bad operations. <laughs> we probably okay. ought to keep the doors down. That's what we ought to yeah. do. Yeah, that's the next step. I don't know how many, yeah, I, uh, my, patience, my patience has run out. Um, and I, I know the committees has as well. Well, th thank you to the three of you for your courage, um, particularly to you, P Private Calderon. Um, we uh, know that we have your back. The law that we that we passed that included the Tenant Bill of Rights is designed to allow you to feel free to share with us freely about the concerns that you have. And we want to make sure that, that uh, the last thing that should drive someone out of the service that that it was a choice they made to serve their country is the housing that is supposed to be keeping your family comfortable and safe. And that shouldn't be a second thought. 
I mean, we all experience problems with housing, no matter where you live. But generally, you should be able to take care of that pretty quickly. And you shouldn't start with your house. <laughs> You're already in a dangerous situation with your job every single day. It shouldn't be dangerous to live in your military housing. And, and it's just unbelievably disturbing that we're still at this level of, uh, of, of danger and difficulty. I mean, seven children fell out of a window with br and had brain injuries in four years? I, 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 I'm, I'm speechless. Um, okay, uh, assuming no other members have questions of this panel, thank you so much for your participation. We appreciate your input and your feedback and just know that we will stay on top of this as a, as a committee. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll allow for a few minutes to switch to our second panel. Uh, and so the subcommittee will stand in recess briefly, briefly for that purpose. <laughs>